The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Let's read. The words of the blessings of Enoch, wherewith he bless the elect and righteous, who will be living in the days of tribulation. Let me pause. That scares me. The days, the, the folks, it says the words of the blessings of Enoch, wherewith he bless the elect and righteous, who will be living in the days of tribulation. He's about to identify who these people are. When all the wicked and the godless are to be removed. The days of tribulation, or when all the wicked and the godless are to be removed. Well, that's starting to change uh, your paradigm already. So the days of tribulation are not for you at all. That's pretty good. That was my high voice. You guys like that? It's not for you at all. It is to remove the wicked from off the face of the earth. It is not against you. And I have to emphasize this because people are so frightened of what is coming. They just say, Lord, remove me. But what people are misunderstanding, the entire reason you're on this earth is that you become sons of the living God, that you become children, true family of the living God. You're not being punished. People theor have theorized just about everything. And a lot of people who are given over to the Sumerian text, they no longer believe there is a higher purpose for people being here on this earth. They have been absolutely usurped. And God will prove himself at the end. You're going to find out the hard way, the sorrowful way. And that's not going to be good. So, the words of the blessings of Enoch, wherewith he bless the elect and righteous, who will be living in the days of tribulation when all the wicked and the godless aren't to be removed. And he took up his parable, and he said, Enoch, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the holy ones in the heavens. And the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything. And from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come. That's you, a remote generation. The book of Enoch is for a remote generation. That means a distant generation. See that? How awesome is that? I'm about to sneeze. Let's hold that back. Anyway, and from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one which is for to come. Concerning the elect I said, and took up my parable concerning them. Okay, here we go. So you know, first of all, you know who this is for. You know what it takes place. It's not some, you know, tragic thing that's going to happen to the righteous. And so who are the elect? According to the words of Christ, the elect are those who are grafted into the branch. The elect are those who God has chosen. The elect are the ones who believe of the Gentiles, the ones who believe of the original people to those he selected. The holy and great one will come forth from his dwelling, and the eternal God will tread upon earth, even on Mount Sinai, and appear from his camp and appear in the strength of his might from the heaven of heavens. And all shall be smitten with fear, and the waters shall quake, and great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. That's pretty bad. The watchers, the big bad watchers, the ones who oversee everything humanity does, the ones that fell the first time, the ones that caused the earth absolute corruption. They're going to be smitten with fear. Keep in mind that when a human being encounters an angel in the Bible, they fall down as though they're dead. Think about that. When Daniel encountered the angel, he did the same thing. He fell down as though he was dead. He didn't look at the angel and say, oh, wow, who are you? That's not what he did. It is shocking to perceive that much power, that type of form right in front of your face. But when God himself comes, he's coming here. They're going to be smitten with fear, and fear shall seize them, it says. They're going to be smitten with fear, and the high mountains shall be shaken. What is a high mountain, anybody know? In this context, something I want you guys to see. A high mountain does not always mean Mount Everest. A high mountain is a place, a highly appointed place with much power. A mountain is a place of power. A mountain is a place of kingship. The office of the President of the United States is a mountain. Do you guys have that? So these places of power are going to be shaken, and the high hills shall be made low, and shall melt like wax before the flame. Oftentimes in the Bible, 
You read about the beast with the seven heads and the seven mountains. And Revelation gives an interpretation of what those seven heads are, what the seven mountains are, what the seven horns are, or, or the ten horns, and the crowns are. What the crowns are gives you an interpretation. The angel gave a direct interpretation of what those things were. Nothing was left to chance. What has happened to us is, a lot of people, they don't read the interpretation that the angel gave. It's almost disregarded. In the book of Revelation, these, these seven mountains, the are seven nations, seven authorities, and kings are appointed to them. That's where the woman sits. So around this woman are seven authorities. Isn't that something? Around this woman, and the beast hates the woman, right? The beast hates the woman. Well, guess what? If the beast is a bunch of nations in the earth, if the, because a lot of people say, well, the seven mountains are the seven mountains around, you know, the Vatican. But they're not talking about physical mountains. In the book of Revelation, it tells you what those mountains are. It tells you exactly what they are. It's just like it says it has the, the, the uh, one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death. It tells you exactly what one of those heads are. Tells you exactly what they are. But oftentimes, again, they're disregarded. In the Bible, you'll often see something that is physical, something we understand. And God would use that physical thing to describe structures of men, power centers, things of that nature. We could call the, the White House, the government of the USA, a tank. Suppose we were talking one day, we referenced the office of the presidency as the turret and we described washington dc as the tank and we said well the tank can take everything out you know nothing can go against the tank although they there are problems inside the tank see that's how things go so god gives us a reference but when he gives us a reference we can look at that reference and it's is so perfectly matched towards the subject that often people will take that take that uh, reference and say well that's what it is but see, God did something. Every time he spoke and utilized these words, if you continue to read, he defined exactly what he was talking about. When he gave it to the prophets, he later described, just, just right there in the same context often, he described what he was talking about. So remember something. When you read a chapter in the Bible, the context is the entire book. When you read a book in the Bible, the context are the rest of the books. And if you want to read with, with great understanding, you'll always have context. You're going to seek to have context. You read a verse, you'll end up reading a chapter. You read that chapter, you're going to end up reading that book. You read that book, you're going to end up reading the Bible. And it gives you great understanding. And it's a great place to have yourself uh, really rooted in truth. Because the slightest slip of the tongue by us human beings, and all of a sudden people start believing things differently. It's not very... Uh, not a good thing. It's not like we do it on purpose. Some people do, some people don't. But either way, our brains lock on to different things and we, we get it wrong. And we these are times we don't have to get it wrong. We have everything right in front of us, at our fingertips. People used to have to go miles to hear the word. Then they had to, you know, scrounge up everything to have a, a copy of the word in their homes. We have everything at our fingertips. If any generation out there has no excuse, it's ours. We have everything at our fingertips. The Bible is not being suppressed. People are just lazy. The Word of God is not being suppressed. People are just lazy. Anybody can go and find the Word of God. Anybody can go and find the Bible. But because things are so available, it makes us lazy. It's a natural force that goes against you in abundance, just in case you didn't know. Anybody who sits in abundance a dark entity is going to be assigned to you with that abundance here on this earth. And it will always be that way. Before you had these tools, many of you said, Lord, if I had this and the other, I would do this and I would do that and I would do this. Well, then you accumulate this, that and the other. And you sit back and say, well, I have it now. I'll do it tomorrow. And you end up having all the resources in front of you. But often you find something is fighting you. Every time you would go and utilize those resources, you have to wrestle and fight through yourself to get to them. In other words, all of us have the Word of God at our fingertips. All of us have had the Word of God at our fingertips for many years. Why haven't we read the Bible a few times? What's stopping us from actually reading the entirety of the Word of God? There's nothing stopping us except us, except that spirit that would speak to your mind that would keep you caught in your own problems, that would keep you locked in a prison, so to speak. Everything is at your fingertips. Remember that. 
Let nothing stop you. You may, you have to make that choice. You have to make that choice to fight through anything. If anything is worth anything, you're always going to have to go through darkness to get to it. If it's worth you getting to, you're going to suffer all things. That means you're going to put up with all things. And you will be persistent. And in the end, you will have accomplished your objective. And nothing on earth or in the heavens can stop you from that. Even God himself had to split up the languages of human beings when they began to work together, when they put their minds to something. If you put your mind to having the Word of God, nothing will stop you from getting the Word of God. But take note that everything is at your fingertips. There's never been a time where the Word of God has been at everybody's fingertips. There has never been a time like that. You live in that time right now. That should tell you something about this time. If you need evidence, there it is. Let's continue. In the high mountains shall be shaken, and the high hills shall be made low. It shall melt like wax before the flame, and the earth shall be wholly rent asunder. And all that is on, upon the earth shall perish, and there shall be judgment upon all men. But with the righteous he will make peace, and he will protect the elect, and mercy shall be upon them. And they shall all belong to God, and they shall all be prospered, and they shall all be blessed. And he will help them all, and light shall appear unto them, and he will make peace with them. That's emphasized. With the elect, he's going to protect them. With the elect, he's going to have mercy upon them, which means you're not perfect. All of us are washed by the blood of the Lamb. That's his mercy. His mercy is Christ. The mercy of the living God upon humanity is Christ. For those who would accept him, we shall all belong to God. We shall all be prospered. That means you're going to be lifted up. You're going to be heightened. You're going to be raised. You're going to be increased. They shall all be blessed. You'll be empowered. To be blessed is to be empowered. To be blessed is not for the Lord to drop dollar bills out of heaven into your house. To be empowered is what you want. If you're empowered, you can get those dollar bills anytime you want. The Lord will bless us. He's going to make peace with us. That is so beautiful. You will be protected. He's going to help them all, it says. And light shall appear unto them. Light shall appear unto us, unto those who are faithful now. That must be emphasized. Those who are faithful now. You know how sometimes when you go through life, and, and if you minimize the end times, your walk is going to be minimized. If you lose focus of why you were saved in the first place, you're going to lose strength and resolve in your walk. If you s stop remembering what the Lord is doing, you're going to lose focus of what you're becoming what the goal is. And if you lose that focus, you're prone to become anything in the world, having lost your faith. You live in those days now. There are so many people, so many people who are being led to other, other ways of life. They're falling like flies. They really are. The faith that was once encouraged through the love of one towards many is being lost. Greed has set in. People are greedy. People are selfish. The sincerity of the word of God is beginning to dwindle. In the Bible it says that the love of many is going to wax colder and colder because iniquity abounds. So that means because people are getting away with evil things and the pressures of life get to somebody who believed in the first place, they're going to start becoming mean to somebody else. I will never be accused of being mean to anyone. That will never happen. Do you know what? Because I will never let anything external influence any relationship I have with other human beings. One person cannot interfere with a relationship to another. A set of circumstances will never interfere with a relationship with other folks. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to let the world do something to me. Something bad happens in the world. As a consequence, I end up having an attitude with everybody I talk to. That will never happen. And no one will ever have the luxury of saying that ever came through me. You know why? Because I choose not to do that. Because I'm mindful of it. And what I'm telling you now is when you're not mindful of these things, you end up doing it. If you're not mindful of these devices of the enemy, these tactics of the enemy, you're going to end up doing something to somebody else you'll later regret. You don't have to live your life with regrets. You just simply say no to darkness. The world can throw everything at me, but I don't believe what the world throws at me, and so I never pass that on to any of you. I can have the worst day in history, and not one of you will ever know it, because you have nothing to do with Satan's attempts to throw me off balance. You have nothing to do with that. 
Do you all see how that works? Satan will often use anybody he can to get to other people. If you believe what he's doing against you, you become a vessel of his darkness against somebody else. My plea to you is to start saying no. Don't allow Satan to use you against your fellow man. Start saying no. Stop believing in these dark declarations in your life. Stop looking in the mirror saying, well, I'm just not going to be anything more than what I am today. Who's telling you this? Who are you believing? What's speaking in your ears? That's not what your father tells you. That's not what the Lord said. That's not what any angel of the Lord would communicate. So who are you, who are you believing? What message are you passing on to everybody else? If it's causing you to think a little deeper, that's called self-examination. There are a lot of people who pass messages of darkness because to them, it's not a message of darkness. When you begin to believe something, it's no longer a message of darkness. Many are falling this way. And why? The root, the root cause of it is they did not love the truth. They were curious about the truth, but they did not love the truth. And I'll tell you something. If you don't love the truth, you're not going to make it. If you're born of the living God, you love this truth. How do you reconcile all of that? If you love the Lord's truth, then stop believing the darkness that is presented to you on a daily basis. Stop passing on the dark messages. And what I mean by that is if somebody upsets you, you're so upset that you upset somebody else. That's passing a dark message that makes you a vessel of darkness, of destruction, of negativity. Start saying no to that. God gave you that body. You're in command of it. So take command of it and start telling it no. So what if your stomach is turning? So what if you're in a high state of fear and you're shaking? Start telling your body no. Remind your body who you work for, who you're family with, who's raising you, who granted you salvation. Remind yourself of that. Encourage your soul with that. In the Bible it says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. If you feel like you're in bondage, you're in the wrong place. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You are not to be in that place of bondage. And I know right now that many of you are in that place of bondage. So then get out of that place of bondage and step into Christ so that you can have your liberty. That liberty is yours. When I said this is not easy to do, but I can be done with the Lord's. I can. Well, actually, it is easy to do. It's very easy to do. I want to ask you something. Who convinced you it's not easy to do? See, this goes back to what we're believing. That's a very good comment. It's a very good example of something. Without knowing we're believing the opposition, it's time for us to believe family. Jesus never told any of us that something was difficult to do. That's not what he said. Jesus did tell us to choose, to make a choice. The only reason a choice could ever be hard is that you step into the unknown. See, we've got to be careful of who we're believing. Because who's telling us these things are hard? Somebody told me, they said, well, it's hard to forgive a person. You just can't do that. Who told you that? Who told you it's difficult to believe, to, to forgive a person? Do you see how many doctrines of the shadows that people carry? These are not doctrines of the living God. These are doctrines of devils, to be blunt with you. These are echoed words of the world. The world is the one that says, you know, stepping into righteousness is not easy. Living a sinless life is not easy. That's what the world says. And we're believing the world over the living God? we got to believe Christ. All you have to do is find the advisements of Christ, which is to read the New Testament. And instead of saying, being, a, being an expert, see, that's what I used to be. I used to be an expert on Michael. That's what messed me up so bad. I was the expert. I was. I had an answer for everything with me. And one day I dropped everything. And I said, Lord, I have no answer for myself. Because if I did, I'm doing a poor job at governing my life. A very poor job. And when I surrendered to all things, that's when I understood what the power of Christ was. Listen to me. The Bible says with man it is impossible, but not with God. You can't do it yourself. And that's the problem. We are trying to do it so we can say we did it. We're not going to be successful at doing it. We are not saving ourselves. We did not die for ourselves. If anything is finished in us, it will be Christ who will finish it. In the Bible, it says he will finish the work he began in us. And see, too many of us are trying to complete ourselves. It's not going to happen that way. A full surrender is required. 
A full surrender is not just saying I surrender. That's not what a surrender is. Not to the Lord. A surrender is when you identify areas of your life you have been keeping from the Most High by controlling it yourself and giving those areas up, saying, Lord, I have no idea what I'm doing in this area. Being absolutely sober by seeing the truth of your life. And how many times did we try to put on a smile only to have it jerked away by one phone call? How many times have we done that? So why did we go to the Most High and say, Lord, I I'm trying to be positive, but it's very difficult. I need help. When was the last time you asked the Lord for help in a real situation? Not doing like everybody else does. But I'm talking about your intimate relationship to say, Lord, I need help. I can't, I can't even stay joyful for two minutes. Because I'll tell you something, when you ask the Lord for something, he leads you to his word. Haven't you noticed? You get this unction to go right to his word. You just don't read what you want to read. You don't go to places you think is going to fit you. You start trusting in him by faith. You go into the word blindly. I do that so often, it's not funny. I'll open up the Word of God. I will not even look at the Word. And I'll say, Lord, God, by hands, let's go. And I will read it and study in those areas I open the Bible in. And why is it relevant every single time to my life? And you know what the body does when you do that? The body will say, give up. Don't look any further. You know, go read something else. This is boring. This, your body will begin to fight you. And if you can get through your body's rebellion, you're going to get blessed. Most people cannot get past the rebellion of the body and of the mind. Because your mind and your body will tell you, ah, don't read that. That's not right. You need to read something else. It will start to override the unction the Lord gave you. But one day, should you press through that and continue by the Lord's instruction? See, I had to take my little rubby fingers off the steering wheel. And when I did that, I was then guided. You cannot be guided so long as you control the steering wheel. In this case, you can only be guided when you take your hands off the wheel. Now, that's a scary thing because you don't know where it leads. And that is the point. Because when you let go and you don't know where it leads, but it ends up being the answer you have been looking for for all of your life. You're going to be a witness of God's resolve through Christ, through the simple reading of the Word of God. You're going to have a breakthrough and celebrate all by your loans. And that's when you'll say, Jimmy Crack Corn. Now I get it. That's when you'll say then you stand in the liberty of Christ. That's when you stop believing darkness, period. That's when darkness cannot make you believe it again. Everybody can come down on your head and you will still believe the living God. You'll get hurt. You could be seized, jailed, whatever the case is. You will not fold, nor can they swipe your joy anymore. That's when you become contagious. And when you become contagious with the liberty of Christ, the best thing Satan can do is to keep people away from you. That's his process. He knows he can't get to me, and I can boldly state that. So what does he do? He tries to get to anybody who's close to me. Anybody who tries to get close to me almost instantly comes under some type of assault, which brings up another principle in the Word of God. See, once God selects you, and you say yes to the living God, and parents, you have noticed this, once you give your everything to the living God through Christ, Satan can no longer get to you. He will try and try and try. But then he doesn't get through, and so guess what he does? He starts to work through with the people you love the most. Now, you may fall for that a couple of times, but then one day you're not going to fall for that either. And he can't work through them. And when he can't work through them, he's really lost the fight. And he works on a bigger scale. He'll always work against you in that regard. But you can see everything he's doing. You can see it. So those of you out there speaking on platforms like this, people are supposed to talk about you. Because if they didn't, yeah, how can you be on the side of Christ? You're supposed to be opposed. You're going to have a messenger of Satan buffet you. Because if you didn't, how could you be speaking about things of truth? You're not to fight all that stuff. You're to continue to go forward. You walk through and over everything. You're made to trample upon everything and to go through everything. You do not stop to get everything out of the way. You keep going forward. You're trying to remove elements that God permits to come to you. You just go right through it. That's how you overcome Satan. You do not stop to chit-chat. You don't make a deal. You don't try to remove elements out of your life. You plow right through them. You continue in your walk of faith. You tread upon everything and let nothing exalt itself above the living God in your life. That's how you go forward. You do not engage darkness. You walk over darkness and through darkness. Should a person be utilized by Satan, get in your way. Thing you just simply say, you don't even have to say it out loud. Move out of my way. 
tell whatever it is that you go forward in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And if they say, well, you don't even know the name of Jesus of Nazareth, say, but I know he died on the cross and you know his name. So in the one's name who died on the cross, get out of the way. That's what you say. And you keep going. You plow through everything. You continue. Because, see, that's in your heart of hearts. You know why you get inspired when somebody starts talking like this? Because that's what you, in your heart of hearts, that's what you want to do. And do you know something beautiful? You'd never want to do that if you did not belong to the living God. Do you know that? So in your core, you have a heart and a belief for all things of the living God. You do your experience in this earth has discouraged a lot of areas, but you can see at your core, your family with the living God. So listen to me. Identify that core piece of yourself and start standing up because that's the real you. The other stuff is just clothing. Do you hear me? It's just clothing. All of your errors, all of your bad choices, it's all clothing. That core individual that you are that wants to go forward in the name of the Lord, that wants to walk over all things of darkness, that wants to lift up the name of the Lord. That's who you are. That's how you stand up. That's what you go forward in. See how in a moment your mindset altered. You got out of the mindset of the world for a moment and into the mind of Christ. Do you see that? You don't have to leave that area. Stand up in the core person you are. Stand up in that core person you are. And live your life that way. You never have to leave that place. Now I know your flesh does not like this. So let me continue. I don't want to aggravate you too much. But now you know. Because you just identified something you had long forgotten about. And when somebody says stand up spiritually. You get back to that root. That you just identified. And you stand up with that root. That's how you stand up spiritually. So the Lord makes peace for the righteous. He protects the elect. He has mercy upon them all. Let me continue. And he will help them all. And light shall appear unto them all. And he will make peace with them all. And behold, he come up with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all. And to destroy all the ungodly. And to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness, which they have ungodly committed. And of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. See, when he comes back, he's going to finish our deliverance. The one thing we cannot do is finish our own deliverance. We can't do that. What we can do is identify spiritually with what we truly are. We can choose the Lord. But listen, by his power, he will center you. By his power, he puts you in a specific place. By his power, he overcomes the darkness in your life. You cannot do it. He does it. That's important to remember. Now, we just had a conversation. How many of you actually began to see the root of your cells for the first time? How many of you saw that? That was not by our power. That didn't happen by our power. You hear me? That didn't happen. If you, l listen to me carefully. If you try to emulate that little peak you just had, good luck with that. You get that peak because of your father's power. You don't get that peak because of information. You don't get that peak because you talked yourself into it. You get that peak because of your Father's power through Christ, which is by the Holy Ghost to us. You get that peak because of the Lord's grace and mercy. The key is standing in the Messiah and believing Him. That's how this whole conversation began. Standing in the Messiah and believing Him. Then you get that peak. And when you get that peak, you can begin to harness. Well, let's just say you can harness things that right now you may think are impossible. You know how people say you'll have access to this and access to that. Well, you'll have full access. And when you have full access, the, the ironic thing is anybody who's given full access does not take a thing. The first thing they do is close off the avenue to the access and they say, oh my goodness, I just experienced, I just felt, I just saw. That's what they start saying. They do not partake of what they have access to immediately. It's so shocking. They shut it back down quick and sit back and say, oh my goodness, it just messes them up. Then slowly you'll start tapping in piece by piece. But that doesn't happen by our power. It's not going to happen by you reading the word, you know, 100,000 times a day. That's going to happen by you believing in Christ. If you cannot believe in Christ, you'll never tap in. Because it can only come through Christ. That means New Testament. That means examining the words of Christ upon your own life. That means believing what he said. 
and you no longer fight what he said. Because in your homes, many of you fight what the Messiah says. He says you can be blessed. You come up with a thousand reasons why you cannot. He says you can make it. You come up with a billion reasons why you cannot. See, for the most part, people fight Christ right now. Even those who say they love him, you're fighting him. When you don't believe in what he said, you're fighting him. When you have an issue with those things he said, you're fighting him. That's what you're doing. He hasn't tossed you out into the dungeons yet. Yet you fight him. Stop fighting him. Because I'll tell you something, which will disgust you a little bit, but something is working through you to fight against Christ. That's not coming from you. There's only one thing that fights Christ. Only one thing. And it will work through every vessel on earth if it has to. Stop allowing it to use you. How does it gain access into your life? By what you believe. And what do you believe the most? The world. That's what you believe the most. You believe the concepts, the ways, traditions, and everything else of the world. So that when you're reading the Bible, you say, well, that's hard to accept. It's hard to accept because you're already believing something else. Something is competing with the words of the Messiah. Something is causing your mind to be confused when you have something. And then all this worldly stuff pops up. See, the world will have you, the spirit in the world, is just like a bully or an abuser. For anybody who knows about an abuser, the only time you have peace is when you have made peace with the abuser. If you get out of step with the abuser, the whole atmosphere of the house is negative. Everything in your life is negative. And the only way to have peace is to make peace with the abuser. Listen, the world spirit is the same way. It will take its peace away from you and leave you feeling naked and insecure. And so guess what you do? Many of you will give in to that spirit, shut the word of God, and start minimizing what you just learned of Christ to make peace with that spirit in the world. And then you're seated back in the good old days or back for a moment. What I'm asking you to do is to step beyond that. No, I just described the feeling and the process. So step beyond it. Have you heard anybody describe that? Because I don't have a filter when it comes to spiritual things. You know, it's hard to get a person who is abused away from their abuser. That the abused person makes excuses for the abuser. Do you know that Satan uses that same tactic on us? Do you know that all of you who have been abused, God gave you insight that nobody else has? And it's time for you to step up to the platform and start sharing that. You already know what Satan is doing because you were abused. People are very close to understanding. One day you'll speak that story of abuse, but it will come out by the Holy Spirit. And when it does, people are going to see what Satan has been doing in their own lives through you. And many will be delivered because of you. Because the truth came through you. How ironic. The quiet ones who were abused. The ones that feel they're not worth anything or worth everything. The Lord is bringing everything to the mark of full. Everything is being bought to attending. Everything is being fulfilled. Now, the theologians, they know a lot of details. But it's almost impossible for theologians to operate purely by faith. Because there's a trust factor. It's not quite in theology. With faith and interpretation, tangible interpretation is very important in theology. But I'm a person of faith, and I trust the Spirit, because it never guided me. I've guided me wrong through intellect. Academia has guided me wrong. For example, in science, what they say is true today in science. The facts that they have come up with, facts are not true. The facts they come up with today may be different tomorrow, which means they were never facts in the first place. They weren't truth. They have a bunch of data points that they try to interpret so that people can understand it. But that changes day to day. The spirit does not change. The truth God gave at the beginning is the truth right now. Truth never changes. And I'm very careful as to what I read because some of you guys have these studies of Enoch. They have nothing to do with Enoch. Having seen some of the original writings, because first of all, a lot of people say, well, Enoch was found with the Gnostic writings. No, it wasn't. There was a copy found with the Gnostic writings. There's a, another copy that two families safeguard. And there is yet another copy that was found in Mexico. It's amazing the way it was actually preserved and everything else was amazing. But it gives you point blank references. And so I like that. 
the parables of Enoch are quite insightful when it's talking about the goats and the uh, the rams and the sheep and the mules and all this and the other. If you understand what they are and you can you can understand that spiritually, my goodness, it'll it'll just mess you up. The seventy shepherds it talks about that goes perfectly with the book of Ezekiel. And there are things in the book of Ezekiel that are augmented to a degree by the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is not an authoritative book. It was a parable given to Enoch and Noah for their times. That's what it is. They give no authority, but all authority they see is in the hands of the one who is Christ, the hidden one from the beginning, the word of God. They edify Christ big time in the book of Enoch. And nothing in the book of Enoch has ever failed. So it's a summary, but it's so right there in your face that it will encourage everybody who reads it to get to, to not to mess around, not to toy and play around. And because it deals with calamity. And it was even said, here's what's funny. In the book of Enoch, it said that when the book of Enoch would surface again, men would be writing books. We'd be, be living in a time where people publish books about everything. That's what it said. It said that people would, uh, you know, be selling books of God's word and selling books of what they thought about God's word and everything else. And isn't it funny how that the book of Enoch resurfaced in a time when people are selling books and not just any books. It meant that people would be selling books about the Word of God. That's what it said. But it would be for those, it will be a blessing to those who identify it. It also said that the book of Enoch would be a blessing to those who live in those times. Most people right now, they don't know the times they live in. They don't know what they're about to face. And every authentic work that a person has done in their lives is just going to be invaluable. Anybody who gives in to iniquity right now is playing with their, their eternal souls. They really are. Anybody who does that. This is a very relaxed time, meaning it feels like you can get away with everything. Nobody has gotten away with a thing. Nobody. God is looking for genuineness. And that and to be genuine means that you operate by faith. That is the test of your genuineness. To see if you will believe wholeheartedly through and through without proof. And it just so happens in this time, many of us recognize the faith element, but there are many who don't. It feels like you can do anything and get away with it, and there's no big deal, which is why a lot of people are calling for justice on everything. They have forgotten that God doesn't allow people to get away with anything. Man, he just does not. Nobody has gotten away with anything. The suffering preserved for those who are on the wrong side is beyond explanation. It is beyond description. It's actually beyond belief. And it's a very good thing God does not actually give us all of that. Because if we knew what awaited those who said no to Christ, if we understood why a person would say no to Christ, you'd have no sorrow for those people who don't make it. And if you understood their punishment, not one person who understood their punishment would ever sin again. No matter what that sin was, they would not sin again. But because people cannot see the instant consequences, because they can't see the consequences of what's about to happen, they continue to do things like it's no big deal. But that's exactly how God established these times. If you operated under the fear of punishment and you knew what that punishment was, for real, everybody would be fake. We would be good so that we would not have to suffer. That's fake. So what did the Lord do? He separated everything. He closed our eyes to the reality of suffering itself. And so we go through things on earth, yes. But in each aspect of our lives, we are being tried to see if we're going to choose, ultimately choose the truth based on any circumstances we go through. That means in your life, you're going to have times when you're up and times when you're down. It is incredibly important that if you truly belong to the Most High, you never let go of the words of Christ. And those who actually belong to the Most High will not let go of the words of Christ. You may have slipped a great many times. Well, Jimmy cracked corn. I'll be the first to say that. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Jimmy cracked corn. God was the first one to say Jimmy cracked corn. People sin like there was no tomorrow. He sends his son. So he's not focused on your sin. He's focused on your salvation. Men, people are the ones focused on your sin. Don't let them get to you so much that they would have you live in your sinful memories. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are murderers. All of us are thieves. All of us are adulterers. We are. We are. We are. We are. All of us are. And without Christ, there's no way we can ever be clean. If you stole a cracker, you're no different than somebody who robbed a bank. If you looked at a woman and said, well, I'd like to have her as a girlfriend or him as a boyfriend, 
and your mind began to wander, you're no different than the one who slept with a thousand different people. You're no different. You're the same ones. You've committed an infraction against God's word. God is the creator of this earth. He made this earth. This is his earth. And when he comes back, everybody who does not belong on his earth who said no to him, they're going to have to go. They're going to get booted on. I normally bring up the past and sinful things so that nobody is on a high horse. There's not one person here who has earned their way into righteousness. Not one. Because for every 20 things you do good, you're going to mess up on something else you never knew about. We couldn't be righteous if we tried. But in Christ, because our sins were moved in him based upon the genuineness and in our intent, our true intent, we are deemed the righteousness of Christ. But it's very important that we never play with our salvation. Let our salvation be thought about on a daily basis, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, that we never forget about the Messiah. It's time for decisions now, and these decisions carry eternal consequences. This is it. This is that moment. These are those days that the prophets talked about. You're living in the times where things seem like they're so different, where nothing can happen, but everything seems to be happening. You live in the time of massive confusion. You live in a time of darkness, but you live in a time of great salvation, of great blessing. Of an impartation, do you not know in the book of Enoch it says that those who are faithful to the Most High will be given sevenfold instruction? Do you know what that is? Sevenfold instruction is unmistakable instruction. And here's what it means. Right now when you're trying to figure out what the Spirit is saying, sometimes it can be difficult. It will not be difficult in times to come. You will know that you know that you know without a, without a shadow of a doubt what God is commanding or asking of you to do. You're going to have spiritual instruction so clear. No one will have an error in what they follow. But that's only for those who continue to say yes now. To continue to say yes now is not to believe the darkness. If you're believing that your life is going to go into shambles, that you are ineffective in everything you do, if you actually believe that, you're not believing Christ. You're not even making room for faith. You're not believing Christ at all. Your faith begins when you understand that you're going to be redeemed. That's your initial understanding. Why do I say that? Because if you believe you're going to ultimately be redeemed, then you know that right now you're in a process. You know that despite your errors, you're being raised. You're getting better on a daily basis. It also means that you choose to believe in the living God. That's your choice. That's faith. No one can ever be forced to believe. That's not faith. When you choose to believe, that is faith. And these times that we live in right now, these times of great opportunity to actually choose the side we belong to and to be faithful and loyal to that side, these times are soon to be over. Time is not dictated by what we think. Time is dictated by the absolute truth. Once a specific number of people come into the fold, that is it. We are at the door where that number will be complete. And that moment it is complete, everything inside of everybody will change. All those who are faithful, that change will be for the good. Those who toyed around and were not faithful will be spewed out the exact same moment. Those who had a little bit, even that little bit is going to be taken away. Because those who actually, in truth, desired Christ, they're going to be granted something beyond belief. Those who have the impartation are not going to be troubled by the end days. Trust me. How do you think people in Revelation love not their lives under death? How do you think people in Revelation did not take the mark? And we know the consequences of that. I can say right now that if not for the Lord, I would take the mark. Not because I would choose it. I would not. I'd rather die. But because I know how Satan works. Satan knows I would rather die. Satan knows he can't do anything to sway me. But he will get a hold of people I love. And he'll dangle them like little puppy dogs over a fire. That's what he'll do. Now, if we don't have Christ, we're going to fall for that stuff. But we have Christ. So when those days come, you'll stand by his power. You will not take the mark of the beast. In the Bible, it says those who are written in the book of life will not receive the mark of the beast. Why? Because of Christ. Because of Christ in you. That's why. Not because of your strength. Not because of your resolve. But because of Christ. Because the King of kings and Lord of lords will be standing inside of you.
and by his power you'll overcome everything until the very end. That's why no one should be worried about, oh, i got to leave this world. I, well, actually, I think the same thing. If left to my own devices, I give you a challenge. All those who want to leave right now, you're still operating under your own fuel. Anybody who operates under the power of the Holy Ghost will never say, I want to leave right now. Because they will understand they're already there. And this is simply a small, tiny conflict. But if you have not tasted of that power, you're not convinced that you'll be spared. And that can cause fear. And of course, you're going to want to leave before anything starts. But my challenge is this. Complete this walk all the way. Be a witness to the Holy Spirit. That no fear be within you. Don't fake it and say, well, I'm not scared. And the truth is, you really are. Don't, you don't have to do that. When the power of the Holy Spirit is at work, you'll know what it is not to have fear of anything. You'll know what it is to have confidence in Christ. This step is coming. Don't miss this step. Listen, no one can make it without it. You know how many times I've thought about the end days and I said, Lord, now I know I've been in some rough spots and I've been through AG double hockey sticks on earth several times. But I still don't know if I'm going to be effective all the way through when all this happens. That's when the Lord began to give me examples of things. And I'm telling you right now, it's going to be nothing like you think it's going to be. And for those who are faithful to Christ now, there is nothing on this earth nor in the heavens that will be able to overpower you should the Lord have you to be here during those times. You will not think like you think now. You will see the truth, the absolute truth, even here on this earth in this form before you're translated. But if you don't know that power, you have no security in the end times. And it looks daunting at best. But you're never going to be left by yourself. So, it's choice time, isn't it? It's choice time. These are not days to play in. These are days to choose in truth. And the Lord is awaiting your choice. Because He's the one asking. Why do you think so many things are happening in your life? Why do you think you're seeing so many things? He's asking for your answer. And you can only give that answer to Him, not by your voice, but by your life, by the truth of you, by your faith. We can say yes, Lord, all day. But if we are not believing in him, we have said no. And the only way you're not going to believe in him is if you believe in all this stuff of the world. You've got to make a choice. It's choice time. It's what will soon take place will be quite expedient. And there's no more time left. Be sincere in your pursuits. Please remember that. Cryptocurrency, the system of cryptocurrency. People are trying to replicate that all day. But there's going to be an injection in cryptocurrency because they're about to really use the architecture of cryptocurrency. They had to get rid. Here's, they did somewhat of a security sweep through all cryptocurrency. So they got rid of people who were not quite fit to have a lot of money, causing them to bail out. They got two more people to get out of cryptocurrency, and they'll be done with that. And you guys know, then they go on the up spike from there. But this time, you have a lot of folks, a lot of governments that have cryptocurrency. Because while they're sitting there talking negative about cryptocurrency, they've all bought into it. Just so you know that, as you guys know that. So right now, it's a very volatile market for all that stuff. And it's a good time to, you know, sit back and not do, not do too much. But when it starts building, the, 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 some of the biometric devices come out the same day it's going to start building. Do you hear me? Cryptocurrency is a good marker. It, it's a good um, clock for the biometrics that we're going to be operating by the entire world. And it's all going to be, it's going to be tied to cryptocurrency. It's a good indicator when this is going to happen. As I said before, they were going to sweep all the people out of cryptocurrency that they could not control. You guys remember I said that. And so if you know how to look into cryptocurrency, like some people have in COT, they said, well, all the whales, this whale was a whale or somebody with a lot of money. They just got them out of there. A lot of people went to jail in cryptocurrency. They did. So they got a lot of people out of cryptocurrency. People that had billions of dollars that nobody could control if they can't control you you're not going to have money like that i'm just telling you now you're not going to have money if they can't control you and they didn't want anybody in the world rivaling their financial status because with finances you can assert some type of control over people and they didn't want anybody to to step out of line or somebody to be rich that they could not control so what they did was they swept cryptocurrency it's funny how the government's got involved and then all of a sudden cryptocurrency started getting swept and, and all the whales were getting um, you know, all sorts of things were happening 
And lots of people died in cryptocurrency who had a lot of money. They have, since since they have swept everything out, you guys know they have unclaimed wallets with millions of dollars in them. So they came up with a policy that after a time, those wallets have to be, they're going right back into circulation. So nobody will have claim to them. So those people who have those wallets who refuse to come forward are going to be broke. So that's how that is. The way that cryptocurrency works is the way that a major system has adopted. And that's what caught my attention in cryptocurrency. Not because of cryptocurrency, but because of the system itself. We essentially have a system in the world that's coming out that operates just like cryptocurrency. So it was important for me to see how the system worked. That was very important. Now I have a, I have a sense of timing as to when they're going to implement some major bank changes for everybody. And it's all about security. There will be no more logging into your bank in the way that you're used to logging into it. It's going to be different. Banks have bought into cryptocurrency too. That's a back channel for banks. Why would all the banks in the USA be holders of Bitcoin? All the banks in the world, right? So here's what happened. Once they switch systems, all the money is going to be controlled by two central big computer systems. These central computer systems just so happen to be node control nodes or, or, or nodes of control or uh, some of the new AI that's out there. So what they're doing is consolidating the financial system, which is a control system for everybody. They're going to lock it down. They know what's going to happen to the earth, so there'll be a few shakeups in the earth. And when the shakeups are over, everybody will be under a new jurisdiction, especially regarding money. Everybody will be allotted some things with that money. But security for that money is going to be based on your biometrics and DNA. So nobody's going to be able to hack into your account. Nobody can take your money. Your money is going to be secure. But the system will also change. In Australia, they were testing out a new system. In England, they were testing out a new system. This system had, had uh, social points involved in it. This system had all sorts of things involved in it. And it had to do with your license also. So as it turns out, your license is about to go away. And your passwords are about to go away. And all of your devices are going to be quite friendly with you. They're going to be your best buds because you won't log into your phone the same way anymore. Your phone will actually know you. When you go to a store and pick up a new phone, if you buy that phone, that phone's going to know you like the other one did. It's going to be weird for a lot of us older folks, not for the newer folks. They're going to talk to their phones a lot about life and everything else. Well, that phone is going to have, it's going to be them. It's going to be a digital representation of them. The, the phone itself, the architecture of the phone is also changing. You'll get into a store. You will not be able to get in the store without your phone. You won't be able to get anything without your phone. Everything is going to be done by your phone. And only you can use your phone. If you're not holding your phone, it's not going to work for anybody else. If you're not looking at your phone, nobody can see what's on your screen. You can no longer show anybody anything. You can't scoot your screen to somebody else and let them see what you're seeing. But they cannot look at your phone. Those phones are going to be highly secure. Which means access levels will change so nobody can hack systems anymore. They're going to do away with the ability for hackers to get into systems. And because AI now lives on the packet level. And here's what I mean by that. you got a wire that's transmitting from one computer to another. A bunch of just signals, right? AI has found a way to live right there at the collision point of the signals. So it does not live on either computer. It lives within the wire in the signals in themselves. Now tell me that is not crazy. That a system could assemble itself in the communications of other systems. You can't destroy something like that. You cannot kill something like that. Hopefully you know that. You can't turn something like that off. You just can't do it. It will live within the signals of other systems, of any system. They found out that AI has determined that it can live in any signal matrix. Not matrix like a movie, but a bunch of signals going back and forth. And it can, at will, assemble itself anywhere in the world. So you're looking at things that have been released that are just, they're mind-blowing is what they are. Right? They're mind-blowing. What does the UAPs and the UFOs have to do with this? Everything. So all of it, you know, all of it will come together in a way. I'm not saying much now because people will dovetail and get it wrong. If I were to say something and somebody were to go back and get a freedom of information release on that thing I said and they actually find it, um, they wouldn't find all of it. Much of it would be redacted, but they would find it. 
And once they found it, they would start talking about it to the world. Before you know it, everybody's going to theorize. And before you know it, everybody believes in the wrong thing. And what bites them is not going to be what they're looking to bite them. So in other words, if, if a bee is released and people start theorizing, they're going to end up saying it's a cat. And while everybody's looking for a cat, a bunch of bees are going to come out from a nest and sting everybody. That's what will happen. That's why information released too soon, that's not really relevant or it's just not good timing. Often those stories can be inflated, uh, changed, altered, and then the end result is something very different than what was initially uh, released in the first place. And if you do that with a purpose, well, the purpose is gone. And we know we live in the days where all you have to do is release something, get about 20 people to believe in it, and all of a sudden it becomes fact in everybody's minds, even when it's fake. There are a lot of fake things out there people believe in, which makes the Bible a, a very sound doctrine. But we know what the Word said, that during these days men will no longer endure sound doctrine, but would heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears, or coming close to the time where power structures are going to be challenged and changed and bluffs are going to be called. Our bluff is going to be called by missiles. And I hope you know what Russia is doing with Iran, because that's for us. It'll take about 34,000 of them, but it's for us. Folks, I'll see you guys tomorrow, right here at the Council of Time.